there, there are people throughout history, right? If I were to say the name uh, of a specific person in history or maybe even a contemporary of our own, um, I'm willing to bet that a word or maybe a phrase would come to your mind. So I'm going to do that now, which means I'm going to need your help. If you don't help me, we ain't, get, we ain't getting anywhere. So I'll call out a name. Maybe you just say, you say a word or a phrase that comes to your mind when I say that name. Uh, Martin Luther. Right, right. So if you're familiar with Martin Luther, then you likely said something about his involvement. Maybe you thought something because you're nervous to speak out in front of everybody. But you, something came to your mind about his involvement with the Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther was a man who sought to reform the Catholic Church. Uh, instead, he wound up marking a movement which brought Protestants, which is one of the reasons we're here this morning. How about Martin Luther King Jr.? Reconciliation, that's a good word. Likely, his, his leadership during the civil rights movement came to mind, right? He, he was one of the most influential leaders in the civil rights movement as he sought to peacefully protest inequality against his people. What about Harriet Tubman? Underground Railroad, right? She was an abolitionist who was known for rescuing dozens of people through the un Underground Railroad. This one might get a little different. What about, what about Michael Jordan? Go. Go. Like, many things may come to mind when we hear Michael Jordan, right? Maybe it's his ability to fly. Uh, maybe it's like that signature, like, tongue sticking out thing as he puts people on posters. Or, or maybe, maybe you're like, man, he saved the Looney Tunes. <laughs> like, what, whatever it is, you likely associate him with basketball, right? Because he was such an impactful player. If, if I said Tom Brady, many of you would have your opinions. You may rightly say that he's the greatest quarterback of all time. And if you don't agree with that, you at least have to say he's the most winning quarterback of all time. <laughs> We know these people because they, they had a lasting impact. Of course, some had a, were more impactful than others, right? Sports are great and all, but, man, the Civil Rights Movement, Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, um, Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, those were a, a lot more impactful. But the impact that all those people uh, who have listed said, uh, the impact that they had is, is likely going to outlive them. They'll be marked by what they've done by who they were. So let me ask you this. This is a rhetorical question, so you're just going to answer in your mind. No need to shout your answer. If you had to take one word or phrase to describe Pioneer Church, what would it be? Think about it. If someone asks you, what is the defining characteristic of Pioneer Church in a word or a phrase? What comes to your mind? Like, may, may God be gracious to us that those outside these walls would characterize Pioneer Church as a church that is unified in love for God and one another. What, what we're going to see in our text this morning is that a defining characteristic of a godly, unified church is love. And Paul is calling the church at Rome to love one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul also helps us understand what he means by love. Uh, we live in an uncertain society that's seeking acceptance and security, so we often hear the word thrown about so much that it loses its meaning. But in 1 Corinthians, we learn that love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking. Is not irritable, does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Love is a godly virtue, a, a fruit of the Spirit. So when you're questioned with what one characteristic marks Pioneer Church, may we honestly be able to say love. While I certainly have experienced and seen the love of Christ among you all, I think we could all admit that, that growing in love would be a good thing for us. Love toward God and for one another. 
And that's what Paul's exhorting us to do in our passage today. So if you will, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15 and stand with me as we read verses 1 through 6. Romans 15, 1 through 6. Paul writes, Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it, was, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. I'll pray for our time as you take your seats. God, you are a gracious God. You're our heavenly Father. You love us. You've made yourself known to us, God, in your word. And so this morning, as we look at these verses in Romans chapter 15, God, I, I pray for uh, the Spirit to work uh, in and through me to proclaim uh, truth, to exhort, to edify, to lift up, to build up, to glorify Christ. We pray, God, as we, uh, as we study your word, that we would fall more in love with you and with one another. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we pick up here in chapter 15, uh, Paul is continuing an argument from the previous chapter. Uh, really, it's, it's more of a plea. Right? In, in chapter 14, Paul's imploring uh, mature Christians to put aside some of the freedoms that they've been given in Christ so that they may love their less mature brothers or sisters well. He, he recognizes the freedom offered to those in Christ, but he also recognizes that some Christians have weaker consciences. We could read chapter 14, and we could get caught up in all the words that Paul writes, and if we do that, I don't think that we'll fully get the principle that he's putting forth to us, to, to the church. Like Paul is writing about those who, who think they should eat only eat vegetables, even though meat is clean. He's writing about those who may fall because their brother is drinking wine. And don't, don't hear me disagreeing with Paul or disregarding his words. Like he's clearly right. The spirit inspired scriptures are where we find our final authority. Uh, the, words of, the words Paul wrote in scripture are for our instruction. But Paul isn't merely writing very specific instructions. Uh, he's giving examples of a principle that he's hoping that we'll we'll take hold of, that we'll uh, take ownership of. The principle seems to be that we, who are maybe further along in one area or another of our Christian walk, that we ought to wait with patience as our brother and sister strive to follow the Spirit into life and godliness. The principle that Paul seems to put forth here is to love one another. And so uh, as we go through these verses here in chapter 15, I, I'm going to steal a little line from Trail. I'm going to be preaching from the thought of let there be love. Because what we're going to see this morning are three breaks in the text that are going to help us, help Pioneer Church move closer to a goal of loving one another. First, we're going to see the problem in verses 1 and 2, that we have a propensity to please ourselves over others. In verses 3 and 4, we're going to see the plan, that we would seek instruction from our Savior and from the Scriptures. And then in 5 and 6, we'll see the purpose, that we would be characterized by our unity in Christ. Look again with me at verses 1 and 2 as we assess the problem. He says, now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. 
And you may read these verses and say, Larry, I don't see a problem here. Well, the very fact that Paul wrote these words for our instructions is proof that uh, we have this propensity, we have a tendency to please ourselves over others. Like the fact that he's exhorting us to the end of pleasing others shows that we, our natural inclination is to please ourselves. Paul's writing this instruction to the church at Rome so that they would seek to please one another because either he's not seen it or he's not heard that they're doing these things. Let me help you out a little bit with, with, with the problem that we're seeing. I tell my two older sons over and over to take care of their sister, to care for her sister, to, to watch out for her well-being. Right, Because uh, there, there's a way that I expect my daughter to be cared for and treated by her brothers, and I want them to know it. I want them to check on her if she's crying or if she gets hurt or she's falling over because she falls a lot. But, but why, do I, why do I ensure that they do that? Why do I have to remind them over and over? It's because they have a tendency to forget. They have a tendency to get caught up uh, with what they're doing instead of checking on their sister when she's in trouble or when she's hurt. And I really want them to do this when, especially when they're the ones who cause the pain. Like, aren't we the same, church? Don't we tend to think of ourselves before we think of others? Don't we tend to consider ourselves more than our brothers and sisters in Christ? Like, I love my comfort. And other people's lives can really mess that up. Like, their lives can be messy, and I'm, I'm guessing that you and I aren't so different. Do me a favor and think back to all the racial tension that we've seen over the past few years. Were you loving to your brothers and sisters who, who didn't look like you? Did you go out of your way to please them, to help them, to understand? If you're white, did you wait until you had all the facts before admitting the brokenness that we were all seeing and experiencing? Or did you care for your brother and sister who could closely identify with the situation? Was it about being right or was it about loving them because they were hurting? And to my black brothers and sisters, were you willing to wait or help correct with patient love while your white brother or sister tried to work out how or even if they should respond? Paul is exhorting us to seek to please others more than we please ourselves. I'm not saying it's easy. I don't pretend to be an expert and I realize that hindsight is 20-20. But if we're striving for diversity, specifically ethnic and cultural diversity here at Pioneer, we'll have to be marked by our love for one another. Patient, long-suffering, painful, forgiving, godly love. I want to be clear, though. We're not called to be pleasers of men. We're not to be in a position where we seek to be yes men or yes women. That, that's not what Paul's getting at. He, he's wanting us to love one another. And he knows that we have a propensity to please ourselves more than others. The tendency to be self-seeking was never lost on God. I mean, isn't that what happened in, in the garden with Adam and Eve? Like, weren't Adam and Eve being caught up in, in this idea, the, these selfish tendencies when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So our propensity to be self-pleasing didn't sneak by God. He knows it. And so he's given us uh, these words from the Apostle Paul for our instruction. He's a gracious God who, who in his kindness gave us the law. I, I'm speaking specifically of the Big Ten, the, the Ten Commandments, to which all the other laws are subservient. Like He gave us the law so that we would know what God expects and that we would know the very character of God. And Jesus wraps the law up in two, uh, in two verses here uh, in Luke. He writes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. The whole law, says Jesus, hinges on love, love for God and love for one another. If you can do that, you'll be right with God. The problem is that for the non-Christian, for the natural man, the law is condemning. 
The law shows, that, shows their inability to love God and their inability to love their neighbor. The law does not give life. Before Christ, we put our trust, uh, before we put our trust in Jesus to be saved, the law was summed up as do this and live. So if you can love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you can love your neighbor as yourself, you'll be fine. You'll make it. You'll get into heaven. You don't need Jesus. I read earlier this week that the law in the hand of Christ says you are delivered from death, therefore do. The law of God is now a sweet friend to the Christian. It's our guide. This morning, if you're, if you're not in Christ, if you've not put your faith in Jesus for salvation, then you're still under that law. The expectation is that you would love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Can you say that you're doing that this morning? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? If you're not in Christ, you're under the law. And this means that the ex expectation is that you keep it. And that's not good news. It's not good news because you're utterly incapable of, of getting to God on how well you perform. But the requirement is that you would keep the law perfectly, perpetually, and personally, and you can't. Adam could not keep God's law and his and his nature wasn't yet corrupted. But all of our natures in this room, we all have this uh, cor corruption by sin. We're born into sin. But the good news is that God made a way to be right with him. He's so loving that he sent his only son to become a man, to take on sin that was not his own. He was beaten, mocked, and crucified because of us. The sins of his people were put on him, and he was killed. He was laid in a tomb for three days that grave would not be his final resting place. That stone couldn't keep him in. He would not see corruption. He was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty, making intercession for those who trust in him. Church, he's mighty to save. His death and resurrection brings sinners to life. And in his salvation, there is no condemnation. If you trust Christ, he will save you. Are you trusting him this morning? If you are trusting in Christ this morning, then, then the law is now a delight. And not because you have to keep it in order to be right with God. It's a, it's a delight now because it's a guide. It's a helper for the Christian life. And when the law is our guide, when it's our guide, we'll be marked by our love for one another. When we're in Christ, we'll be marked by our love for one another. Anyone can say that they love God and live however they want, right? It's easy to say those words. But the evidence of loving God from the scriptures, the evidence of loving God is that it can be seen in how we love one another. Like I can tell you that I love pizza, but if, you, but if every time you offer it to me, I turn it down, you're probably not going to believe that I love pizza. So I can tell you that I love God, but if you don't see me loving others, then you're probably not going to believe me. Our love for one another is an evidence of our love for God. More than that, though, Paul says that we ought to seek to please our brother or sister in Christ. Why? Look at the end of verse 2. To build him up. We seek to, to please our brother and sister in Christ that they may be built up. Love does not require us to look past sin. That would be unloving. Love does not require us to sit on our hands or compromise our conviction. No, Paul says love builds up. In chapter 14 of Romans, Paul's showing the seriousness of not loving one another. He says if you, if you don't consider your brother or sister more than yourself, if you're not willing to put, a, put aside some of the freedoms that you've been given in Christ, then you could cause your brother or sister to fall. That's not good. Here in chapter 15, he shows the positive implications of, of love when he says that it will build them up. Church, we're not going to move anybody further in their understanding of Scripture without love. We'll not move anyone further in their Christian life without love. We will not move further toward being a multicultural church without love. Love will be our most powerful weapon, but a lack of love will be our greatest downfall. And so though Paul exhorts us to love one another, I'm so thankful for the, for the Apostle Paul. He, he, he tells us to love one another, and then we're like, I don't know how to do that. And then he tells us how we can do that. He gives us the tools. He equips us. 
Look at verses 3 and 4. For Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction. Why? So that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. And in these verses, we find the tools that Paul gives us. What I want us to see in verses 3 and 4 is the plan. Right? The problem was that we have a propensity to please ourselves over others, but Paul doesn't leave us without a solution. He gives us the plan, which is to seek instruction from our Savior and from the Scriptures. When Paul calls for us to love one another, he realizes we can't do it in our own strength. I think all of us who are Christians this morning would know that, right? We know that. We can't get out of our own way sometimes. And, and so uh, Paul gives us some tools we need something outside of ourselves to give us the power to achieve what we can't achieve on our own. The two sources that he offers is our Savior and the Scriptures. In church, Christ is our Savior, right? Amen. Amen. But he's not only our Savior. What we see in our text is that Christ is also our supreme example. Before Christ can be your example, though, I want you to hear this. Before he can be your example, he must first be your Savior. What I mean is that we cannot merely follow the example of Christ and then think that we'll be right with God without first trusting in Christ for our salvation. In other words, we can't separate the benefits of Christ from Christ himself. When we see the beauty of the gospel of Christ, when we take hold of the benefits uh, that, that uh, he offers, you don't, you don't have Christ without also having his benefits. And you can't have Christ's benefits without first having Christ. And Paul, who fully realizes this, he exhorts those of us who are in Christ to see Jesus as not only our Savior, but also as our supreme example. And the example that Christ has put forth is, is one that sought not to please himself, but to please others. That's what Paul wrote. Look, at, look again at the beginning of verse 3. He said, for Christ did not please himself. I'm not sure of like a more powerful point of reasoning. Like Paul said, love one another more than you love yourself. Seek to please your neighbor more than you please yourself. And like that's hard enough, right? And then he goes, Jesus, Jesus didn't seek to please himself. And so it, it can almost feel burdensome, but there's freedom in Christ because Jesus took our burden and he gave us his burden, which is light. His yoke is light. Let's think about what Paul means, though, specifically like as it relates to the quote. So he's quoting from Psalm 69, which is a beautiful psalm, by the way. I'd invite you to read that uh, this week on your own accord. We're not going to read it this morning. Uh, but, so he's quoting from Psalm 69 that the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. The perspective that Paul is hoping that we'll see is twofold. That Jesus came to do the will of the Father and that he came to take on the sins of many. He came as was planned before time began, to usher in eternal life. He came to fulfill the promise set forth in Genesis 3.15. He is the promised Savior who is the seed of the woman. He came as a revelation of God. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. It was his mission and his pleasure to complete the will of of the Father. But it was more than that, right? Like he came to do the will of the Father, but he also came for us. Like he dwelled among us, God with man. He gave sight to the blind. He gave strength to the weak. He cleansed those with disease. He, he healed those with disabilities. He raised Lazarus. He raised a man from the dead. He gave faith to those who didn't believe. And in the end, before he was betrayed, he was prepared to drink the cup that set before him. He was willing to die in order to satisfy the righteous requirements of God and to save sinners. He was resolved to die for us, to taste God's wrath for us. And that's why we're here this morning, because, church, he's done it. He did those things, and death couldn't hold him. He, he, he rose victorious as he defeated sin, death, and the grave. That's good news. 
Because if we're honest, church, we're all broken. We're all burdened. And the Bible says that, that Jesus can take away our sins and our burdens. Our burdens of shame, of guilt, of fear, of anxiety. All you got to do is trust him. He's held out to you this morning. Take hold of him. He came for this very reason. And he did not come to please himself. And it's because of that that Paul calls us to see Jesus as not only our Savior, but our supreme example. Seek not to serve yourself, but seek to be like your Savior and serve one another. But there's more than that. There's more tools than that. Look again at, at verse 4. And Paul tells us the value of the Scriptures, that they are for uh, our instruction, and in them we find endurance, that we may bear all things for Christ's sake. We find endurance that we may agree with Paul that to die and be with God is better, but in our living that we may submit ourselves fully to Christ, to the spreading of his gospel and to the building of his church, that we may endure with one another as God has made a pattern of patiently enduring with us. And more than just endurance, we find encouragement in the scriptures. In them, we find encouragement as God's plan of redemption unfolds. The scriptures are telling a single story about God working out his plan of saving sinners. Every page that we turn reveals more truth about God, about God working to save sinners, to mold them into his image, and to bring them to their final resting place with him. The scriptures give instruction that in them we might find more of Christ, that in them we might be compelled to trust Christ more. And the end of our time, the, the, the purpose of our time in the scriptures is that we would find hope. And what is our hope, church? What is our hope but the, the risen Lord who is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf? The pages of scripture drip with the hope of God saving sinners in Christ. And during his time on earth, we, we know that Je Jesus was gentle and lowly, right? He was compassionate to those who had wronged him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do is what he cried out on the cross. He loved sinners. He loved his disciples. He was humble. <laughs> and we can't be those things. Not perfectly. We, we can't love one another perfectly. We can't uh, be perfect in our humility. But we can strive to have the same disposition as our Savior, right? The same disposition of humility, the same attitude of humility. Like, do you, you, you want to know how to love your, uh, to better love one another? How to seek to please one another more than to please yourself? Look to your Savior, look to the scriptures. Seek to please God as you pursue godliness and Christ likeness. Strive to submit to the scriptures as a guide toward holiness. And when we do that, church, when we do that, God is gracious to bring us to the purpose of it all. You see, Paul presented the problem, right? That we have this propensity, this tendency to please ourselves over others. And then he gave us the plan. He gave us these tools that we would seek instruction from our Savior and from the scriptures. But why, Paul? <laughs> like, why do we need to consider one another more than we consider ourselves? Why do we need to, to seek instruction from our Savior and from the scriptures? I think verse, verses 5 and 6 give, it, give us that answer. Look again at verses 5 and 6. Now, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. It's in these final two verses of our passage that we find the purpose. Why, why do we seek to love one another? Why do we seek instruction from the scriptures? So that we might be characterized by our unity in Christ. Twice in these final two verses, we, uh, we, we find Paul point toward unity. He writes, live in harmony with one another. And then he writes, with one mind and one voice. And for both of these pointers toward unity, he says that they're built on what? They're built on who? Where do we find unity? According to Christ Jesus and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's where Paul seems to direct us. Paul's exhorting us to be unified in the truth and by the faith that we have together in our Lord Jesus Christ. In all of it, the love for one another, the seeking to follow the example of our Savior, being unified, all of it is for the glory of God. Pretty easy, right? Like, like uh, doing those things, loving one another and, 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 and finding truth in, in this Bible that we hold in our hands and, and seeking our Savior, those, those things are, it's pretty simple, right? Pretty simple principle at least. Love one another. Look to the scriptures to guide you into truth. Be unified in your Savior. Like the task is simple. The words are easy to read. But making it work is really hard. Like it's hard, it's hard when everybody looks like you, but imagine how difficult it is when you put us together with those who we don't naturally surround ourselves with. It gets a little more difficult, right? It takes intentionality. It takes creating time and in, in the busyness of your schedule to have an open dinner table. Have people into your home who are in different life stages. Ask questions, seek to know one another, create discipleship relationships. Like we want to be multicultural, right? Here's where it starts. Be hospitable. Make time for one another. Seek to please one another over yourself. In 1992, the most dominant team ever was formed. Until the 1992 Olympics, NBA players were not allowed to complete, compete for Olympic medals. Instead, the team would be made up of amateur players. Uh, after the, uh, the USA could only grab a bronze trophy in 1988, they, uh, there was a vote that would allow NBA players to compete for the gold medal. At first, they only wanted two NBA players. They would we'll let two. That was turned down, so they let them all. The team began being assembled in 1991. It was made up of some of the most dominant players ever, at least of the time, right? Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Larry Legend, uh, Charles Barkley, Scottie Pippen, Carl Malone, Patrick Ewing, John Stockton, Clyde Drexler, Chris Mullen, and David Robinson. Most of these players were at the top of their game. I don't know if maybe you don't pay attention to sports, but uh, over the years and across many different kinds of sports, uh, there have been many would-be dominant teams that have been formed. They are formed by some of the greatest players to ever play their position. A lot of times, though, those teams don't work, right? These players have large egos, they begin to make a team game about themselves. From what I've watched and from what I've read about the guys who made up the 1992 Dream Team, most of these guys knew that they were good. They knew it. A few MVPs on this team, league MVPs, finals MVPs. Like they thought that they were the best. They thought that they carried every team that they've ever been a part of, and most of the time they did. Each, indiv each individual player thought that he would likely be the key piece to winning the gold medal. Like they were each incredible players. So how do you temper these egos? How do you get them to play together? How do you take the best players at the time and get them to play in harmony? If I had to guess, I'd say they were able to make it work. They were able to complement one another's games because they were unified around a single goal. To bring the gold medal to the USA. That they were more focused on the goal than on themselves. I'd say the same is true for us, church. If we'll set our minds and our affection on, on God and his glory, then we'll be unified. It won't be easy. It'll take humility. It'll cost our time. There may be tears. There will be a need for repentance and forgiveness. But it'll be worth it. You know, and... In John 17, we get to read a prayer that Jesus prayed. We refer to this as the high priestly prayer. Do you know what he prayed for in John 17? Let me read this portion for you. Jesus prayed. I pray not only for those, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Listen. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. 
May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one. Over and over, he's, he's praying for this oneness. He says, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. In the, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus prays for unity among those who trust in him for salvation, among the church. Jesus prayed for it, and Paul gave us some tools to make it happen. And it will only come by loving one another as we hold fast to our Savior. So I'll leave you with this. May our legacy at Pioneer be that we are characterized by our unity in Christ as we love one another like Christ has loved us. Let's pray. Father, for your grace, we're so thankful this morning for your word, for the scriptures that give us uh, knowledge of the truth, that lead us into godliness. God, we're thankful for our brothers and sisters who, who gather together weekly to be built up, to build one another up through singing, through uh, reading the scriptures through prayer. God, I pray that you would establish a legacy of love here at Pioneer, a love for you and a love for one another. Would you keep us uh, close to our Savior this week as we go forward? And it's in his name, in the name of the one true king. Amen.